I mean, just think about it. If uh, it weren't for the pandemic, we wouldn't have got this version of Roman Reigns ever. Because uh, Vince McMahon would have still been in charge. He would have not turned Roman Reigns heel. And a hell, Paul Heyman and Roman Reigns. Well, that's a combination Vince McMahon wouldn't have paired up because Paul Heyman was with Brock Lesnar. SummerSlam 2023 in Detroit was just freaking amazing. I mean, uh, excluding the Bloodline story, Jey Uso versus Roman Reigns tribal combat, this was really good. So let's review the show. I will try to keep it as short as possible. This is my first ever podcast. So let's see how that goes. I will try to keep it as short as possible. But again, it's a podcast. It's meant to be long SummerSlam 2023, let's start off with the first match. And the first match was pretty obvious. Logan Paul versus Ricochet. Now, you got to understand why Logan Paul was the first match. Because his brother, Jake Paul, had a boxing fight against Nate Diaz. And he had to fly from Detroit to Texas. And that's why Logan Paul was the first match. It was pretty but obvious thing. But uh, talking about this one, it was a really hard-hitting match. I mean, uh, you didn't expect a hard-hitting match from Logan Paul and Rikashi. You expect a high-fly match. But it was hard-hitting. Logan Paul showed his boxing skills. Apparently, he's a better puncher than uh, Shane McMahon, I guess. Shane McMahon doing his uh, boxing moves in the corner. Well, Logan Paul does it better in my opinion now. <laughs> Obviously, there was the high-fly stuff. Uh, Logan Paul was uh, trash-talking. He was pointing to Samantha, who is the real-life uh, fiancé of Ricochet. And it was a back-and-forth match. I mean, uh, all the matches were, but uh, this one was uh, really back-and-forth. The momentum shifted back-and-forth throughout the match. And this one was given plenty of time. It wasn't like Logan Paul had to rush into this match. The match was over in 15 odd minutes. And no, it was given plenty of time. I guess it was about 25, 26 minutes. So it was given plenty of time. And uh, booking Ricochet and Logan Paul was really smart. I mean, Ricochet knows how to handle himself. And um, Logan Paul, well, that guy is a natural genius. I mean... Whatever stuff he is getting into, he is just a master at that. Entertainment, he has got it. Boxing, he has got it. Pro wrestling, well, apparently he has got that as well. So, that guy is just really amazing at whatever he does. Logan Paul, well, he hit a one lucky punch on Ricochet with the brass knucks to sneak out the win. So, apparently this feud is not over. Yeah. And rightfully so, because we need a Ricochet versus Logan Paul part 2. Because it wasn't clean and Logan Paul doesn't come out every week on Raw or on SmackDown. He comes in for this big pay-per-view. So now this feud will get some breathing time, in my opinion. So this is not over and it will go again. That was a really great match, a great opening, and Logan Paul, man, that guy is just exceeding expectations, as usual. From his debut match till now, he has just exceeded expectations, he has a really amazing frog splash, okay? So, yeah, Logan Paul versus Ricochet, it was a thumbs up for my side. I mean, in the morning, 5.30 in India, watching this match unfold, it just woke me up. I'm a sleepy ass uh, sitting on my couch watching this one and uh, whatever I am seeing, well, it just woke me up and it uh, prepared me for the next matches and uh, credit to Logan Paul and Ricochet because uh, at times during these early morning PLEs, I tend to fall asleep. I don't know why, but I tend to fall asleep. I just uh, am sitting there and I am uh, going boink and I am... Uh, dozed off for about and half an hour and I've missed a bunch of stuff so this match kept my eyes open and uh, I guess credit to Logan Paul and Ricochet and um, the second match on the card was Brock Lesnar versus Cody Rhodes you got to understand how 
big Brock Lesnar is and I will come to that point later in this one because he is just a giant of a man and I don't know uh, how he moves so fast despite being such a giant. I mean, he is just one of a kind, really. Cody Rhodes obviously starts hot, but Lesnar, as usual, classic Brock Lesnar match, he turns it around and he welcomes Cody Rhodes into Suplex City. He just ragdolls Cody Rhodes around. I mean, Suplex is here, Suplex is there, German Suplexes, all kinds of Suplexes, he hits it. And after every move, Brock Lesnar was throwing Cody out of the ring. So he was trying to get out a count out win. But uh, Cody Rhodes, well, that guy doesn't give up. He doesn't give up very easily. And uh, Brock Lesnar was getting fed up. He tried two F5s, I believe, out of the ring. But still, Cody Rhodes makes his way in. Now, this moment, like Brock Lesnar throwing Cody out... Cody breaking the count out and coming inside the ring. Brock Lesnar taunting to stay him down. That was the moment I believe earned him the respect. And I will get to that respect part as well. And when Cody Rhodes got in for the final time, Brock Lesnar was standing on the other side of the ring and Cody Rhodes was taunting Lesnar. And I was literally sitting on my couch shouting for Cody to make the moves. Like his Cody Kutcher, his disaster kick. I was literally shouting that and the very next moment exactly that happened. Cody Rhodes hit I believe two disaster kicks. And did he hit a Cody Cutter? I'm not sure. I guess he did but yeah Cody Rhodes, trademark Cody Rhodes moves. Okay so that was where I was, I was pumped up when he hit that. I mean, when you're sitting in front and uh, when the wrestler makes the moves, you know or you are just shouting out, it just uh, pumps you up. Yes, he hit those moves. Uh, good on him. So, yeah, and uh, I talked about Brock Lesnar being a giant guy. Cody Rhodes placed Brock Lesnar in a Kimura lock, okay? I just thought it was so funny because... Brock Lesnar is such a giant dude that he was not even fitting into that Kimura lock. I mean the wrestling Kimura lock, not the real MMA one, but the wrestling Kimura lock. He was not even fitting in. His That giant frame of Brock Lesnar wasn't even fitting. I mean, it just looked so funny. I mean, you should have uh, you should have watched that. It it The size of Brock Lesnar, just my God. <laughs> it just made things funnier, but... Uh, yeah, finally Cody Rhodes was able to hit three consecutive co- crossroads to get the win. I mean, in every Cody Rhodes big match, you get three crossroads in the end. It's a, it's a Cody Rhodes template, okay? So next time, if you see three crossroads, you have to consider the match is over. Unless there is an interruption, like how it happened against uh, Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. He hit three crossroads. He was going for the third one and Solo Sikova hit the summon spike and Roman Reigns speared uh, Cody Rhodes for the win. That's a different case. But uh, when Cody Rhodes hits three crossroads, you have to understand the match is over. And Lesnar lost clean. That's the big talking point. Lesnar lost clean. It wasn't like the uh, first one, like how he got the win. He was in a Kimura and then... Uh, he just rolled him up for a win. No, this was clean as a whistle. And Lesnar shook Cody Rhodes' hand. Now, you have to understand. Generally, when Brock Lesnar is shaking a wrestler's hand, he is going to get that F5. He got it with John Cena, gets it with Roman, gets it Goldberg. You name it. Whenever Brock Lesnar shakes someone's hand, he is getting an F5. But Brock Lesnar actually shook Cody's hand and they both acknowledged the crowd. It's such a big moment and Triple H rightfully pointed out for Cody Rhodes to understand how big of this moment is, he he hasn't really sunk it in. Lesnar showing respect for Cody was unplanned and according to Triple H, it will take time for Cody Rhodes to sink it in and understand how big of a moment that is because Brock Lesnar doesn't do this shit. He doesn't go out, respect... Maybe behind the scenes, he respects everyone. But uh, not on camera. 
he maintains that level of aura, that level of uh, authority in the ring. But uh, he shook his hand, they acknowledged the crowd. It was such a big moment, in my opinion, because Brock Lesnar has never, ever done that. And overall, it was a really fun match. It was good storytelling in the match with Cody Rhodes struggling to get back in the ring. And as I said, that earned him the respect. And uh, yeah, Cody Rhodes sells really good. Brock Lesnar, when he decides to sell for someone, he just sells his ass off. So yeah, Brock Lesnar versus Cody Rhodes, uh, another thumbs up. Two great matches. I mean, all of the matches were great on SummerSlam. But yeah, it was a really good match. Again, I didn't doze off. Which is the speaking volume, sir. So let's go into match number three. Battle Royal. The Slim Jim Battle Royal. So there is nothing much to talk about here. Ellen Knight came in as the heavy favorite to, to win this match. And I posted on my channel, Wrestling Scenarios YouTube channel. If you don't follow it, just go ahead, follow that channel. I make videos on wrestling. Bite-sized videos on wrestling. Whatever I think. In short you get the opinion there. So, I just talked about this, about LA Knight, that uh, why LA Knight is not able to... Like, uh, uh, something was missing with LA Knight. That was my point. Even though he is hot, he's over with the crowd, he is not able to, like... Uh, WWE is not pushing him very hard. That was my point. And something was missing with LA Knight. And that was basically a story. So, storytelling was missing with LA Knight and the lack of matches. Lack of victories, I'm sorry. He has wrestled about 41, 42 matches and he has won, what, like 8 matches only. So, in 2023. So, that was my big issue with LA Knight. Um, but he came in as the heavy favorite. He eliminated Sheamus in the end and he won the Battle Royal, which was, which was in my opinion, a deserving winner. And they had a short feud. Sheamus and LA Knight, they had a... Uh, brief one week feud we will uh, take it like on Smackdown they faced each other LA Knight again got the win and now again Sheamus may have been pissed so again Sheamus and LA Knight in the last two makes a lot of sense okay so the talking point what was the talking point of this battle royal well battle royals are supposed to be for the returning guys if someone is making a return slot them in into the battle royal well, Omos made a return and he had a decent showing. He eliminated, well, like four or six guys, I guess. So, but four to five guys, he had a decent show, but he was ganged up and he was eliminated, okay? He was ganged up by everyone in the end. I guess six people ganged up on him. Last one being LA Knight, they threw him out of the ring. So, that was Omos for you. He made a return with MVP. I don't know where Omos was and I don't know what the future holding on for Omas creatively there is nothing for him in my opinion the next talking point is actually Chad Gable well, you may think what why is Chad Gable why are you discussing Chad Gable well if you just see Chad Gable is damn over in right now I mean next to LA Knight Chad Gable is also over I don't know all of a sudden Alpha Academy is getting all this uh, great reaction and at one point, you thought, or if you have not thought about it, I thought it looked for me that uh, he was going to win it. At one point, but uh, he didn't. He was eliminated in the Battle Royal, and he was not even in the last uh, six, I guess. So, I mean, it was a good showing for Chad Gable. The crowd was super over when he just uh, throws his hands up and says, uh, Thank you. So, Chad Gable is Chad Gable, he does this, and yeah, um, Chad Gable is really over, Alpha Academy is over, I'm really happy for Chad Gable, man, he is getting his flowers now. And the next one is Austin Theory, well, why the hell Austin Theory participated in the Battle Royal? I mean, it was really weird to see Austin Theory there, but yeah, they addressed the Austin Theory and Santos Escobar feud in the Battle Royal itself. So, kind of makes sense because Santos Escobar was anyways scheduled to participate in the Battle Royal. It was confirmed on SmackDown itself. So, that makes a ton of sense. Again, the Battle Royals are messy as usual. But LA Knight eliminating Sheamus to get the win. The crowd popped huge. And yes, they addressed the feud between 
carrying cross and AJ Styles. So the main issue I'm having with carrying cross is I'm not able to understand that guy's character. I mean, he has been in WWE for quite a while. He had a good run in NXT, but uh, I'm not able to understand what Karrion Cross is, who Karrion Cross is. He has this just flashy entrance and uh, that's it. That's uh, all about Karrion Cross. He has this feud with AJ Styles, but uh, has it elevated him? I don't think so. It hasn't elevated him anywhere. So let's see what happens, how Triple H books Karrion Cross because that dude has a massive potential as well. But uh, anyways, that was the battle royal. LA Knight came up with the win. Match number four. Let's go on to the women's match. The first one of the night, Shayna Baszler versus Ronda Rousey and MMA rules match. So, although it was built as a MMA rules match, you got to wonder, obviously it had to have the pro wrestling feel too. Okay? So, if you are an MMA fan, Okay, if you watch UFC and if you watch WWE as well, you would have caught this match, okay? See, I understand, I completely understand why the crowd was a dead quiet. The, in the first three matches itself, the crowd was, uh, um, what we can say, they just gave out all their energies. I mean, LA Knight won the battle royal and obviously LA Knight being so over, the crowd had to cheer for him. So, nobody cared about this match as much but uh, I did and that's why I loved it not it was particularly not the greatest match or the best match on the card obviously it was the weakest match of SummerSlam 2023 but uh, yeah I have to address some points of what happened Shayna Baszler in the early moments hit a head kick which rattled Ronda Rousey now, if you are an MMA fan, you would have got this. Holly Holm finished Ronda Rousey with a head kick knockout, which turned out to be Ronda Rousey's final MMA match. So, you've got to understand this because both of these are MMA fighters, former MMA fighters, and putting in this little touch was really good. I felt it was a nice touch. And... For about a year, Ronda Rousey was so deflated because Ronda Rousey is this huge MMA star. You don't know now, but she is the reason women's MMA exists, in my opinion. Okay? So, that happened. Shayna Baszler hit a head kick and it threw Ronda Rousey out of the ring. That happened. I thought it was over then and then. I really thought so. But it didn't. Um, later in the match, it seemed like Shayna Baszler was injured. But obviously, it looked kayfabe. And Ronda Rousey demanded to finish this. What they had started. So, obviously, friends turn enemies. They had to finish what they started. And after this, they went back and forth. And finally, after going back and forth in the ring, Ronda Rousey was locked in into the Kirifura clutch by Shayna Baszler. Ronda Rousey just basically passes out. She submitted for the first time in her WWE career, in a pro wrestling career to be honest. And it was a really good win for Shayna Baszler. And apparently, this was Ronda Rousey's final match in WWE for the moment. So, I guess she's retired or... She is taking a leave of absence, but uh, yeah, she is gone from WWE for the moment. And they address this tonight on Raw. They address this tonight on Raw. Shayna Baszler came out with a promo and she said she basically drove Ronda Rousey out of WWE. So, that's that. And I guess, she, I guess Ronda Rousey also acknowledged that uh, it was because of Shayna she started wrestling and now she has beat her. It's done for her. So... I don't know what the future holds for Ronda Rousey, but for Shayna Baszler, this was a really, really important win. If you guys don't know, Shayna Baszler was and she was the most dominant NXT champion. I mean, the way she was booked in NXT was just really amazing. That feud with Heidi Sin was really mind-blowing. But 
I hope WWE capitalizes this because uh, Shayna Baszler got the biggest win of her career and uh, and apparently she has some scores to settle. She said it on Raw. She has some scores to settle. She is now the baddest woman on the WWE roster. She beat uh, Zoe Stark. So, yeah, uh, crowd was not excited as I said. Uh, crowd was not excited as I was. It was pretty deflated. They didn't seem to care at all. But overall, it was a really decent look match. Okay, I mean, it was not the best one. Obviously, it had to have that MMA uh, angle to it. But uh, yeah, it was really decent. If you guys dozed off on this one, well, the next one you would have probably woke up to the chops. Of Gunther and Drew McIntyre. I mean, Gunther versus Drew McIntyre was just hard hitting. I mean, you could literally hear the chops. Okay, so just the match. If see the earlier match, what happened in the earlier match? Like Shayna Baszler versus Ronda Rousey was uh, the electricity went out in um, where I am. I was watching the electricity just went out. I don't have an inverter, so. But, I didn't have any backup, so I was pretty pissed off at that. But five minutes later, the electricity just came on, and it were the entrances of Gunther and Drew McIntyre. I was just playing with my phone, and this match was a wake up for me, and it was a wake up for the crowd as well. Okay, the crowd was pretty deflated. I was deflated because the electricity went out. The crowd was deflated because they didn't care about Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler. So. There was nothing too special about this one, mind you. There was nothing too special about this one. But as usual, it was a Gunther classic. Another Gunther classic. We caught everything we needed. I mean, Gunther targeting Drew's back. That was the point. And then Joe McIntyre coming back with a chop of his own. With his own chops. And then chest getting red. I mean, in every single Gunther match, right from his pro wrestling debut I guess the chest of his opponents are bound to get red okay so both of their chests got red and uh, yeah both of, both men studied each other really when that's what the point of this match was because uh, you know Drew McIntyre and Gunther have faced before and uh, that was I guess at WrestleMania so the WrestleMania triple threat match so they have studied each other pretty well and it just needed one mistake from Drew McIntyre for Gunther to just cash in and get the win. So what happened was they were battling it out on the top rope. Drew McIntyre slipped and he got um, his balls were hurt if I have to put it that way. So what Gunther did well in the match the in the same match previously, he hit a power bomb, but it was not enough. So, what he did, he just went to the top. He just hit a splash, and then for good measure, he hit a power bomb. No, I guess it was a clothesline. Yes, it was a clothesline first, and then um, he hit a power bomb. So it was like three moves uh, continuously. He Drew McIntyre had no chance of getting up, and. It was a clean as a whistle finish. So if you are confused, I will just like reiterate what happened. He went to the top rope. Drew McIntyre's balls got hurt. He fell down. Gunther hit a splash. Then a clothesline and a power bomb. So three moves just for good measure. One, two, three. Clean as a whistle finish. Gunther, his reign continues. I mean, the right person won. Because Gunther has to beat that intercontinental title reign of a honky tonk man so he has to become the longest reigning IC champion I mean he more than deserves it and uh, what about uh, Drew McIntyre I mean Drew McIntyre versus Gunther there is no point in furthering this feud they are not looking at it anyways because uh, on Raw tonight we got a new number one contender in Chad Gable. Yes, you heard it right. The most over a man right now after any night. Chad Gable. He has won a shot at the Intercontinental title and the Gunther, well, he is smiling about it. Anyways, what about Drew McIntyre? Where does Drew go on from here? So I don't know. I mean 
reports are suggesting that uh, he was going to leave WWE and not uh, sign the contract. I think it would be pretty stupid on uh, uh, Drew McIntyre's part. I mean, WWE is hot right now, so it would be pretty meaningless if Drew McIntyre leaves WWE right now and joins a rival company. I mean, when would he join other than AEW? So he would become basically Drew Galloway and just go around the Indies. I mean, if it is the right move for him, good for him. But uh, the AEW track record uh, speaks volumes here because whoever has joined AEW, well, uh, the past WWE talent, the ex-WWE talent AEW has signed, well, not all of them have succeeded. There is only... Probably John Moxley and Chris Jericho who have succeeded and they were on that debut show. The when AEW started, they were there from right right go. From the world go, they were there. So after that, whoever joined them and they haven't succeeded pretty well. Tony Khan Deb makes a uh, makes an announcement, then Drew McIntyre maybe comes out with three weeks, he is hot and that's it. Okay, so that's the AEW template. Then after that, you and I, we are going to forget. Okay, so it would be pro- perhaps a heel turn, heel turn is coming. Um, because uh, I don't see much uh, happening to Drew McIntyre at this point. Like creatively, I don't know who we leave feud against. But uh, yeah, let me just think about it. Who we leave feud? Like once he comes back or once he is a full-blown heel. I just can't think of any names because uh, so WWE has basically have to write this story for good Drew McIntyre now. Pretty interesting because Drew McIntyre, a former world champion, he is not having any stories. It just uh, speaks volumes to how WWE works and times how wrestlers are not able to find any stories and it speaks volumes. But anyways, let's go on with the next match and I will uh, allow you guys to think about that who should Drew McIntyre face. Um... Or uh, should uh, Drew McIntyre leave WWE? Should Drew McIntyre uh, like join AEW? Or should Drew McIntyre turn heel? It's uh, just uh, you, uh, you guys think about it. And we will just discuss the next match. And the next one was a storytelling classic. Uh, Seth freaking Rollins versus Finn Balor for the World Heavyweight Championship. Now, first of all, WWE has this habit of... Uh, posting great I mean amazing hype videos but uh, this one in particular was really amazing I mean it was a great hype video and uh, yeah I mean uh, partly it was helped because of the story these guys had the history between them uh, the seven year history these guys had so it was it was pretty darn good so Seth Rollins uh, straight away came in with the mind game. So in SummerSlam 2016, what gear he wore, he wore the same gear uh, in SummerSlam 2023. So that itself pissed off Finn Balor. And Finn Balor had uh, seven written on the shoulder, which he got hurt. So pretty good at that. So it was good storytelling. It was again another back and forth contest. And you got to understand this. Finn Balor is pretty pissed off about the... Shoulder, which he got injured. Had he not injured that shoulder, who knows, he could have been a good universal champion. He could have had that title for about six, six, seven months or for a year. Who knows? So, Wayne Parler basically tried to injure Seth Rollins with the same move he got injured. So, in SummerSlam 2016, we all know Seth Rollins hit a power bomb. I guess it was a buckle bomb on the barricade. And... Uh, Finn Balor's shoulder got stuck and that's why his shoulder got dislocated there. And today in SummerSlam 2023, Finn Balor basically tried to do the same move. Unfortunately, Seth Rollins couldn't get injured there. I said unfortunately and I'm thinking why I said unfortunately. Well, then Mr. Rollins tried to finish the match with the pedigree. And uh, as you guys know, or if, even if you don't know it, I'm going to say it anyway. In 2016, Pedigree was his finishing move. But uh, here now, the Storm is his finishing move. So uh, it got changed, the Storm was banned and all kinds of shit. And then Storm was back. 
whatever but pin as usual kicked out and then the judgment day obviously got involved now when Damon Priest walked out he hit a cheap shot on Seth Rollins when the referee wasn't looking and he looked like he was genuinely trying to help Finn Balor but Finn Balor didn't care he wanted to stick to his plan A now the plan A was to Finn Balor to beat Seth Rollins clean I guess that's how I saw it okay but uh, when he tried to change his plan like when the plan was changed it was too late because uh, when uh, Damien Priest was trying to give uh, Finn Balor the money in the bank briefcase and was uh, trying to capitalize like he was telling Finn Balor to hit him with the briefcase and capitalize so that uh, you can become champion but what did Finn Balor do well uh, Finn Balor gave the briefcase back to Damien Priest and uh, Damien Priest said, well, okay, you are the leader, it's your match, you call your own shots. Later, when Finn Balor kicked out, oh sorry, when uh, Seth Rollins kicked out of the Coute Gras, he asked for the briefcase. Now, what did the Damien Priest do? He didn't hand him the briefcase, he just slided that briefcase into the ring and he tried to distract the referee. And as I said, it was too little too late because when Finn Balor tried to get that briefcase, Seth Rollins hit a well-timed stomp on the briefcase on Finn to pick up a win. It was a really great match and I just can't wait to see what happens between Finn Balor and Damien Priest because that tension has rose to a next level because Finn Balor is saying he lost because of Damien Priest. Damien Priest is saying that even though the entire Judgment Day was helping you, you couldn't sneak out a win and you couldn't become WWE Champion. That was what happened on Raw today. So, it's pretty interesting what would happen and it all looks like Finn Balor would be ousted from the group. But, the interesting part here is JD McDonough. What's JD McDonough doing of here so probably when Finn Balor is out and uh, JD McDonough is going to team up with JD Mc uh, what am I talking about Finn Balor is going to team up with JD McDonough that's all it seems about right now he even helped out he even helped out Finn Balor by injuring Sami Zayn so yeah let's see what happens I mean WWE can surprise us by putting out uh, Damien Priest because why not? But Damon Priest is a heel, Seth Rollins is a face, so anything can happen. I don't see Damon Priest cashing on uh, uh, Roman Reigns. It's impossible, okay? So Damon Priest has to cash in on Seth Rollins. That is only move. And they are in a feud against each other. So not in a feud, but uh, they are having their moments against each other. So let's see where that goes. The three main event uh, or the dubbed main event okay let's just call it the women's main event let's call it i was struggling to find the words there asuka versus charlotte versus bianca belair the triple threat match for the women's cha uh, championship so first of all i don't know what the titles are called right now like uh, which title is asuka holding and which title is uh, bianca uh, sorry which title um uh, Rhea Ripley is holding. I just couldn't figure out the name. So I'm just going to call it women's title. Okay, so the triple threat match. Okay, it was a classic triple threat match. Okay, so but first of all, what caught my eye? Okay, it's going to sound cheesy. It's going to sound uh, probably funny or uh, you may say, hey, what a weird guy you are. Call, it, call me that way. I don't care. Okay, Bianca Belair walked out and uh, the first thing that stood out was her braid that color of her braid that blonde golden color just stood out for me i mean for like three minutes i mean for the time she made her entrance i just was looking at at that braid and i was just thinking my god that braid is shining today okay <laughs> i mean that's me okay I, um, i'm sorry i just felt it that way okay Anyways, the triple threat match, it had really cool spots. Again, nothing special about this one. It was really cool. 
good sports. The three have amazing chemistry. Okay, Charlotte Flair, Bianca Belair, and Oscar. They have amazing chemistry between each other. Whenever they have wrestled singles matches, they have good chemistry. So they had a really amazing chemistry. And yeah, Bianca Belair had a nasty fall. I thought she was legit injured for a moment, but she actually sold a knee injury. She came back and she hit a 450 to break the submission hold. So, I mean, it was really good to see that angle of Bianca Belair's story. And it was meant for something else. The Bianca Belair injury was meant for something else, which we will come to. Okay. She hit a 450, as I said. And throughout the match, I kept on thinking, what was Asuka's plan? Okay. I kept on thinking because Asuka had promised she had a plan for this. Okay, so I just kept on thinking what was Asuka's plan. Turns out it was the blue mist. Okay, so no surprises. Eh? It was absolutely no surprises. Asuka spits the blue mist on Charlotte Flair. Charlotte Flair was in a figure for um, what's her submission move? Figure 8. Figure 8. So she was up. Uh, she was on the figure eight submission move on Bianca Belair, but uh, Bianca Belair was just about to tap, but Asuka slided herself in and she hit a blue mist. But out of nowhere, Bianca Belair, despite being still in submission, she rolled Asuka up and she got the pinfall. Uh, sorry, yeah, pinfall win. So she won the title. But guess what? Bianca Belair was injured. And what happens to injured injured wrestlers? Somebody with the money in the bank briefcase just slides themselves in. And immediately walked Io Sky. Io Sky, your woman's money in the bank briefcase holder. She walked out with Bailey. Bailey took out Asuka and Flair with the briefcase. Bianca Blair tried fighting Bailey, but it was just too much. Io Sky attacks. Bianca Belair on her injured knee. She cashes in, hits this beautiful moonsault. I mean, Eoska has a really beautiful moonsault. She pins Bianca Belair and she becomes the new champion, the new women's champion. And the celebration begins. And guess who joined them? Dakota Kai. So Dakota Kai also joined them. I mean, just think about this. Think about... Uh, think about... Uh, the damage control here for a minute. One year ago, they made that return and they confronted none other than Bianca Belair. Okay. Today, one year later, Bianca Belair won the title. Okay. In her event, she won the title, but uh, Io Sky cashed it on Bianca Belair, and this has come just full circle for them. So it was a great moment. Overall, a really good match. It was just a full circle moment for Eosky and Eosky is your new women's champion. So let's see where that needs her. Great moment. Amazing to see that. And let's head on to the main event. The tribal combat. We are 40 minutes into the episode. The first ever podcast episode. It had to be little long. I had to go in depth. I have to share my thoughts but yeah tribal combat roman reigns versus jay Uso. it was just pure cinema okay it was just the pure cinema i mean if this feud or if the bloodline story was made it into a movie i mean it doesn't get any better than this that's what i'm talking about i mean Roman Reigns, first of all, didn't give his uh, necklace, that uh, ceremonial necklace. They call it the Ula Pala in the Samoan uh, culture. He didn't give it to the ref, obviously, because uh, the referee is a low-level species, uh, according to Roman Reigns, I guess. So he didn't give it to the ref. Instead, he said to Jey Uso that uh, if you beat me in this ring, I personally would uh, put on the Ula Pala on your uh, neck and I will anoint you as the tribal chief. That was the uh, 
starting moment of the match and immediately you felt the tension you just you just knew the stakes were so high for Jey Uso and it was a traditional Roman Reigns match it was slow it was methodical Jey Uso had to come out strong but he didn't and it was a traditional Roman Reigns match there was heavy emphasis on story the match quality doesn't matter because if the story is told, the match quality is automatically taken care about. So, as usual, heavy emphasis on stories and this match, it's anywhere anything goes. I mean, travel combat is anything goes. But I got confused for a moment because on the www.com website, Travel Combat, they had defined Travel Combat as nobody will interfere in this match. So, I was a little confused there, seeing Solo Sikoa just uh, getting involved. Just excuse me for a moment. <coughs> yeah, I haven't talked the 40 minutes straight uh, in a long time. So, anyways. Solo Sekoa got involved. So when Solo got involved, I got confused. Like, what are the rules of travel combat? So, and the it was supposed to be no interruptions according to WWE. But uh, you can't have a Roman Reigns match without any interruptions. I mean, come on. It's an obvious. Uh, I mean, my comment was uh, to WWE was like, uh, haven't you guys been watching or haven't you guys been seeing what's happening right now? I mean, in every Roman Reigns match, somebody gets involved. There has been, there hasn't been a single defense of Roman Reigns without any interruption. Earlier, before the Usos were getting involved, and now Solo Sekoa or Paul Heyman or in somebody new, they get, they keep on getting involved. So yeah, but that confused me a little bit but i wasn't surprised i just thought solo sekova was going to be involved anyway but the involvement of solo sekova just things got interesting after that because solo sekova was accidentally speared by roman reigns in the ring and if you follow wrestling scenarios on youtube i just listed out why solo sekova is going to be the next tribal chief the next in line what are the hints given by wwe so that solo sekova becomes the next tribal chief and it seems to me that roman reigns is actually scared of solo sekova this may sound really like what are you talking about but yeah it seems so the hints right now are suggesting that roman is scared of sekova so Solo was pissed. I mean, he was ready to launch. He was ready to attack Roman Reigns. But he couldn't because uh, Jey Uso speared Roman Reigns and uh, they, he speared him through the barricade. They were discussing it on the outside. They have, they were having an argument on the outside. And uh, after uh, that, uh, Jey Uso took out Solo Sikoa with a splash on the announcer's table. Similar to how Solo took out Jimmy Uso, his brother. And yeah, we will, we will get to that guy in a bit. We will get to Jimmy in a bit. But uh, J Uso uh, speared Roman Reigns, I guess. And then uh, hit his Uso splash on uh, Roman. He was just seconds. I mean, he was just uh, one pin count away from a win. But... Uh, Jimmy came out of nowhere, he pulled uh, Jey Uso out and he stared a hole through Jey Uso. I mean, <laughs> why Jimmy, why? That was the question. I mean, <laughs> he stared a hole through Jey Uso, he super kicked Jey Uso and just walked off. So, we still don't know where Jimmy Uso's loyalties lie because on... Raw today, they have advertised SmackDown to be like Jimmy Uso's return to the island of relevancy. But uh, I don't think Jimmy Uso is uh, going to join the bloodline. See, I'm being pretty honest about it. Because uh, he was the one who kicked Roman Reigns on his head. But Roman Reigns uh, planted the seeds on Jimmy Uso's mind that, uh, hey, if you weren't injured... It would have been you, Jimmy Uso. You would have been the right-hand man. So that was 
probably the planting of the seeds moment I guess and uh, that's what is making him jealous in my opinion but uh, because whatever opportunities he could have had in this singles run like uh, today we know Jey Uso as this amazing singles and the tag team wrestler and that's because of his run as the right hand man main event Jey Uso well that main event Jey Uso would have been main event Jimmy Uso so that might be the reason why Jimmy Uso turned on Jey Uso it's a lot of Usos right now so let me just finish off the uh, review of the match so Jimmy Uso basically just walked off Roman Reigns confused but hey he will capitalize any moment so a table was set up in the corner earlier in the match he just uh, speared Jey he threw the table one, two, three, Roman Reigns just retained the title, he retains the tribal chief status and he rules the bloodline. So, it was a pure cinema, amazing, amazing match. I mean, later Paul Heyman just said that they are just getting started. In the press conference, they asked him in which innings they are in now. They are just in the bottom of the third innings according to Paul Heyman. So, the question remains, is Jimmy Uso with the bloodline or not? Why did Jimmy turn on Jay? Is it jealousy? The most important question in my opinion is not even related to Jimmy and Jay Uso because they are going to feud now. So, that's a question answered, okay? Main question is, where does Solo Sikoa's loyalties lie now? Because we saw what happened in the previous week. So, Solo Sikoa, he was getting groomed for something big like uh, when uh, Roman Reigns said that I am the tribal chief, the camera didn't pan to Roman Reigns. The ca hard cam was panned on Jim. Uh, what am I talking? The hard cam was to was on Solo Sikoa. So, for just a few seconds, it may have been a mistake. But hey, in this bloodline story, nothing is a mistake. So, let's see what happens. I mean... Lot of questions then answered, which is probably good because if you are telling a good story, then you have to have a lot of questions then answers. If you are going to keep the story evolving, I mean, just awesome, right? Like three years we are into this, and uh, still the story is feeling fresh. It's not getting dragged on. At one point during 2022, I believe before Sami Zayn. This story was getting dragged on a little bit. I felt that. The fans felt that. And Sami Zayn was a much needed addition to the bloodline to get that story moving forward. Okay, so yeah, overall it was a really an amazing match. Apparently this was Roman Reigns' longest match. And according to Dave Meltzer, whom I don't trust at all for any of the reports, Roman Reigns actually got injured. Yeah, you heard it right. Roman Reigns was working injured on that match. He was he was injured pretty early. But I mean, I don't trust Dave Meltzer because you have to take Dave Meltzer's report with a pinch of salt always. Okay, they used minimal weapons in this match because tribal combat anywhere, whatever happens, like it was basically no DQ match. So, uh. Like they used minimal amount of weapons and whatever they did was enough anyway. So a really amazing match, a great way to end the show. Surprisingly no big returns. I was expecting big returns like the return of Randy Orton. But hey, I can't blame Randy Orton either because he is injured, he is working, I think he was injured on his back, so he's got surgery and everything, like, he may be basically retired, I mean, such a long career, but, what, what can we say, I mean, we have to celebrate it, just cherish the moment, okay, and I thought Bobby Roode was also going to return, uh, for some reason, there were reports that Bobby Roode was also going to come back, he didn't, we got a surprise return of Omos and next night next night on Raw we like where is where is Omos? So great show overall, really amazing show and uh, yeah, nothing much to talk about it. I mean they have like developed some feuds. We are like 
like what can we say like they have developed some feuds now they have some feud closers in this one like Drew McIntyre and Gunther that's a feud closed it's over I don't think they are going to build it up more where does Drew McIntyre go on from here I don't know perhaps a heel turn that's the only way Drew McIntyre could like get back on WWE TV in my opinion let's see okay let's see WWE is being very patient, okay, with a number of stories. So, you got to be patient as well. Just uh, as fans, we tend to be very impatient. So, that's the lesson, okay. Just be patient with whatever you are watching. And just enjoy pro wrestling. You don't have to compare this and that. Yeah, I compared it in this podcast itself between AEW and WWE, I know, but we don't have to be toxic about it, okay? AEW has its goods. WWE has its own goods. So, they have their uh, pros and cons, okay? So, let's see what happens. SummerSlam 2023 was a blast watching it. Show was a bit long, 4 hours. The show was probably 4 hours long, but yeah... It was a really amazing show. Looking forward to the next PLE and the next time we will meet. So, I'm planning to do this regularly. I'm planning to review PLEs. Only premium live events or pay-per-views. I'm not planning to do anything else on this podcast. If I do, obviously videos or the audios will be there here. So, if you listened watching this, you can give me a follow. This is Hari from Wrestling Scenarios signing off and I will see you guys in the next one.